And I don't think it's much of a, a secret to anyone in the global sphere that they've had an, a, a problem. And so I think that was a the first time that I can think of where someone was saying, like, we need to be careful about what we're doing here. Uh -huh. And that's when you start to get into really sticky territory that nobody really wants to to discuss. Do you have any opinions on the military conflict that's gone on so far between Russia and Ukraine? Uh, my name is John Fonts. I recently retired from the military after 24 years on 1 January. Um, I spent my last 16 years of the military uh, in the United States Special Forces. And the last four years, uh, from, from the summer of 2017 until the summer of uh, 21, I served at the NATO Special Operations Headquarters in Mons, Belgium. And I uh, was the Director of Exercises, Evaluations, and Assessments. Um, and that kind of sums it up in a short thing, unless you wanted more. Um, probably good for now. Although I imagine we'll, we'll probably get more into it depending on where the conversation goes. Yeah. Certainly. <clears throat> Um, okay, so you had a, I guess, a mutual friend reached out to connect us because I imagine you obviously probably have a decent number of thoughts on everything that's going on today uh, with respect to Russia and Ukraine and everything. Sure, um, absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of people, which is good, are having their own thoughts on what's going on. Um, and I had a unique experience uh, when I was there in NATO. One of the things that I think uh, that might be a little bit different is on the lower levels, I... Uh, as the director of evaluations, NATO has a thing called the response force. Mm -hmm. Every year, different countries offer up troops to get certified, interoperable, be able to talk to each other, fight with each other, plan with each other for events that would be an Article 5 reaction is what they're intended for. Mm -hmm. But every year they do that. And in uh, 2019, Ukraine offered up a battalion size, about four to 500 troops to be part of the NATO response force. First mm -hmm. time ever that uh, a non-NATO nation offered troops and we evaluated them. They passed. They were considered certified combat ready. Mm -hmm. um, it was a wonderful event. They celebrated in epic fashion. Um, and I don't know, you know, when you look back on it now, it's kind of maybe one of the things that maybe was poking the bear. As we might say, um, this is definitely something that said, hey, we are capable of doing this. Um, we are welcomed to do this. And there was a lot of talk about more being done. And so I think uh, that led to probably some of uh, perhaps uh, warning signals to other people that would those that would not want this to be uh, done further. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, <clears throat> so I guess. Is there anything, I guess before I start asking questions, is there anything you wanted to center the conversation on today? We kind of traded some emails, but we didn't get into anything too specific. Um, sure, no, um, I mean, if people have questions that are interested a little bit about how some of the Ukrainians felt, especially just from the military perspective. Um, I was there in Kiev a few times in 2018 and 2019, mm -hmm. spent the majority of my time with the uh, Ukrainian special uh, operations. So, but had a lot of time listening to them, talk to them. Uh, but then also just a little bit on sitting there at a, my headquarters was a strategic headquarters headed by a three-star American uh -huh. um, and sitting in all the different briefings and all the different uh, discussions about, hey, Ukraine's coming in and things like that. If people are interested in kind of concerns, as you would have any time you want to let someone into an alliance, um, and also some things that people were really looking forward to for having them come in. Um, you know, what we try to do especially inside headquarters like that is to look at the pros and cons. And there is pros and cons. There is pros and cons of having someone come into NATO. Um, there is pros and cons of taking action for someone who's outside of NATO. Uh -huh. um, there's pros and cons of taking action militarily, economically. Um, so those kind of things of, are, are some things that you know I've heard and, and, and had discussions about. And if, if that's what someone might be interested in, happy to focus it there. Um, well, we've had a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of heated debate on this, I guess, over the past few days on my stream with other people. Um, <clears throat> I guess from, um, there's a lot of different directions we could go. Well, okay, we'll start, we'll start in a basic area. Um, I understand there might be some things you might not be able to talk about or don't want to talk about. You can always tell me, obviously, if that is the case. When it comes to Ukrainian membership in NATO, how do you feel, how would you feel about that in 
in three points of time, from 2008 to 2014, and then from 2014 to 2022, and then say after this war onwards. I'm curious, like in each stage of time, like how, like what you feel like was the appropriateness of approaching Ukraine to join NATO. Uh, yeah, I, I won't, I won't even load it anymore. Yeah, I'm just curious here you talk about that. <laughs> um, sure. I think uh, when we think about 2000 to 2014, mm-hmm. a very interesting time. You're only talking about, you know, at that point, the start of that window is 10 years after the fall of the wall. Of course, there's been a lot of discussion about what has or what hasn't been discussed uh, back when Germany was reunified. Uh-huh. Um, so there was a lot of discussion that said, hey, we weren't going to expand it. But then, of course, we did. Um, and we took a lot of the Warsaw Pact in there. I think 99 is when Poland and a lot of the Baltics came in around that time. I'm not for sure, but somewhere uh-huh. around there. Um, so at that point, I believe there was a lot of belief that bigger is better. Hey, we have a we have an alliance. We want this, this is for deterrence, correct? I mean, that's one of the things we really got to keep in mind when you talk about NATO. It is a deterrence alliance. Mm-hmm. It is not meant to uh, be able to go and into someone else's sovereign territory and exact things. They are meant to come into former sovereign territory of NATO members and restore it. And that's where it stops. Um, so I think at that time, bigger would be better. We had a lot of people joining there in that time following the Warsaw Pact. I mean, from our side of it, you're saying, hey, this is great. We're getting more nations, but you also have to look on the other side of those that would not want it. They see it as an incursion. Of course, the further west we go, the further those borders are going to be. I don't think we had much belief in that time period, 2000 and 2014, I think is what you said, or did you say 2008? Um, 2008 was my understanding is when the first semi-formal offer was made to Ukraine that they kind of had like, we're not going to let you in now, but you're like on a path to be accepted essentially. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there's always that belief that, uh, you know, NATO's expansion was, it's perceived as a, a threat to, mm-hmm. to Russia. And why wouldn't they think that, uh, they're getting closer and closer. Uh, there's no buffer between them and where people are putting troops, as well as just anything else. So when you share a border with uh, your adversary, there's a lot of different considerations. Mm-hmm. So, But from our standpoint of having like, Ukraine in there, I think it would have been wide open. I don't think we really thought that NATO was going to have any kind of, uh, of confrontation or any kind of wars. Mm-hmm. Once you hit 2014 and Crimea falls, I think that was the first time that maybe some things really changed. Um, and, uh, you know, for those that are listening that are interested in Ukraine and its history, I did want to say, like, if they've never seen the documentary Winter on Fire, it's totally worth your hour and a half to get in there and uh, understand a little bit of the people's plight against this at that time was joining the EU. Um, and they were on a midnight decision. Yanukovych decided he was not going to um, and took Ukraine out. And the resulting uh, a couple months there, uh, in 2014 is a wonderful way for people to understand a little bit about what the Ukrainian people have been through mm-hmm. and their view of Russia. Uh, obviously not favorable, sure. uh, but it kind of starts really, really there uh, because of just how they, they viewed Yanukovych as, as a puppet of Putin. And then at the end, he would fly away and, and fly to Russia. So it was kind of uh, a validation of like, hey, this is, this is how deep that goes. <clears throat> 2014, you know, till just before this, um, I don't think it would be much different. Uh, but some people would be concerned about the fact that, hey, Crimea has fallen. We still have other places our Russian separatists are, mm-hmm. are full of it. So it would have been perceived as a bit more provocative, I think, the, the closer to 2014, 2015 that you would have tried to get Ukraine in, which I think is one reason why it took a little while and let them have their evaluation and, and, and come in. But I also believe that people did not feel Russia had the ability militarily to stop it. That Russia um, didn't or that Ukraine didn't? Russia didn't have, you know, the ability to throw their weight around in the ring. Oh, okay, okay. I think they've been a declining power for some time. Gotcha. Um, and and I don't think it's much of a, a secret to anyone in, in, the, in the, the global sphere that they've had an, a, a problem and they're their power comes down to their nukes, really. You take away their nukes and their economy is equivalent to that of Italy. Mm-hmm. So they're not uh, someone who can 
put sanctions on somebody else. They are reliant a lot for their money. Um, and so I don't think during that time period, it would have been, we, I don't think we, having them join would have, would have raised many eyebrows. Mm -hmm. But as we got closer, <laughs> uh, and you know, for me, especially in my experience, when we, when we finally had them get certified, um, is when you saw a lot of further activity. They started to do, so Russia would be doing these exercises that initially led to this invasion um, all the time. They'd put troops on the Western, I think the, the, the name of the exercise was Zapad. And in Russian, that means West. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just their message. Like, we're going to come to the border and we're going to do an exercise called, uh, we're, going, we're going this direction. Um, and so I think people started to be a little bit more cautious about it. Um, and what we ended up doing, even with the, the Ukrainians in our exercises, is we didn't let them into the intelligence sphere. Um, and that was part, I think, messaging saying, hey, we're not going to give them the intelligence. Obviously, there's going to be a ton of intelligence that NATO has on Russia. Mm -hmm. um, but hey, we're not going to share it. And so I think that was a the first time that I can think of where someone was saying, like, we need to be careful about what we're doing here. It's not so free to have any, you know, growth of NATO is always good. You know, there is a limit to it. I mean, as again, when a deterrence alliance and then as a nation ourselves, we're trying to protect our national interests, our national security. A good question that's fun to ask and people have debated is, how many more nations do we need to join NATO before our national security is good? You could argue zero. How many, have you, who do we need to join NATO before the United States feels secure? You could argue nobody. Hmm. Um, so that makes the question of like, well, how much more security do we need to, how much more European security do we need to aid to? Yeah, I was going to say, it feels like um, when I look at NATO and I think about the mission of NATO um, past 91, I think there were questions a little bit about w what role would NATO serve, right? As being the chief anti-USSR pact with no USSR and then no Warsaw Pact, well, what's the point? Um, it feels like going forward, the, the scope of NATO's mission expanded to less even US security and more like general security of Europe. Because it seemed like if you had you know that NATO membership card, you were pretty safe as a country. Nobody's gonna roll in and mess with you because NATO is gonna come in and absolutely ruin your shit, right? Yeah. Um, it feels like NATO's mission past 91 expanded more to the general security of Europe. And I feel like from 91 till now, it seems like that's been largely successful. If you are in NATO, you're pretty free from people messing around with your borders next to you. Um, <clears throat> expanding that alliance to include those other countries seems to be positive for most people involved, um, with some, I guess, being upset that some militaries aren't chipping in enough money or whatever. Trump talked about that a bit. Um, but I would say that past now, maybe a little in 2014, um, and then especially today, I think it feels like countries are looking at NATO with a bit of a renewed purpose. Um, because now, at post Georgia, post Crimea, post the rest of Ukraine, um, now it's starting to feel like with Russia being a bit more adversarial, maybe NATO does have a, a greater purpose. Um, or even like we can harken back to the old purpose. Something that I want to talk about in regards to that, or I'm curious for your, for your opinions, is it feels like Russia is rewriting a little bit of what international relationships are supposed to look like post World War II, post 40s. Like countries aren't really supposed to invade other countries to threaten their territorial integrity. That doesn't happen, right? E even when we look at like NATO interventions or US interventions, right? If we think about Kuwait or Kosovo or Bosnia um, and the greater Yugoslavian stuff, like we'll go in or Libya, we go in, we eliminate something that we perceive to be bad, um, which we can argue is like a, an infringement on sovereignty, but there's no like territorial claims. We're not like trying to take over things. We're not trying to claim land. And it feels like this is really the first time we've seen this in the past 80 years where another country is literally invading, instating a new government, stealing land, um, yeah, how do you think that that factors into everybody's mindset, I guess, now in Europe, Asia, across the world? A lot. When you say the, how countries perceive NATO, are you talking about NATO members or other members or, uh, you know, non-NATO members or NATO members? Well, it, I guess it felt like um, a lot of the rhetoric surrounding NATO was that NATO is, especially in 2008, when we had conversations about new rounds of NATO people joining, people were like, why does NATO exist? 
It's just all it's doing is provoking Russia. Do we really need NATO? Is this really like, you know, could we do this to the UN? Um, th that, so it seemed like that's what I mean, like the perception that like, why does NATO exist? But now it seems like the perception, if you look at countries like um, like Hungary, Poland, um, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, now these people are looking at NATO it's like, I actually feel really good with NATO right now. I'm glad I'm in NATO because I don't want to be like Georgia or Ukraine. So it feels like the purpose, the perception of NATO now has a renewed purpose as a result of that. That's what it feels like to me. <clears throat> Yeah, I think so. Um, an interesting fact, too, also is Lord Ismay was the original Secretary General, the mm -hmm. uh, first one of NATO. And he was quoted as saying that the purpose of NATO back then mm -hmm. was to keep the Germans down, Obama. the Russians out, and the Americans in. And so it's really interesting that, well, one, the Germans are not necessarily needed to be kept down anymore. Mm -hmm. So you could say that if you follow that logic, the, the purpose of NATO now is to keep the Russians out and to keep the Americans in, mm -hmm. um, which is a very interesting take on an alliance about European security. Again, that was 75 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're looking at a how it, how it perhaps relates today. Um, and the fun thing that people would talk about is, OK, keep Russia out of what? Out of anyone? or out of those original NATO members. And if it's the original NATO members, you know, then why have we expanded? If it's not, why aren't we expanding more? Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people, in my opinion, mm -hmm. felt wonderful about new membership up until about a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And now they're saying, well, wait a minute. One, this isn't even a NATO member. So we get to go ahead and throw the flag and say, this isn't our fight. Or two, that's uh, not a member, but we should hustle them along so that we can continue to keep Russia out. Mm -hmm. I think that definition of keep Russia out of what is not unified right now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, I mean, <clears throat> a, 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 a few things that you can look at in terms of like, well, you know, what does NATO exist to do? Is it deterrence? Then, then we just need to like, then, then technically, we just need to stay inside our borders and be fine. And we can send other things to them. I mean, there's there's different ways of promoting democracy or promoting other things inside Ukraine that's not necessarily membership. I mean, you can do it through military means. You can do it through non-military means. Uh -huh. um, you know, but uh, you got to be careful because even sometimes through non-military means, you're starting to cross the line into like, well, what's the end goal of providing all this to just get back to sovereign territory or to punish Russia to the point where, you know, Putin is, does it, people will say, I'm sure all over the place, he's got to go. Now you're talking about regime change, which can still be done through non-military means. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start to get into really sticky territory that nobody really wants to, to discuss. And the further West in Europe you go, I think the less of an appetite you have, if you're talking to someone in, in, in Poland, I mean, their desire to have a border with Russia is pretty darn low, whereas it might not be so interesting to Spain or Portugal. So how much are they going to shift in there? So I think what it's doing now is, is, is making NATO define its deterrence status. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, I mean, it seems... I mean, if we look at the entire history of NATO and Russia, it seems like it's pretty effective, right? Like NATO has yeah. never attacked Russia. Russia has never attacked NATO. Um, so insofar as it fulfilling that purpose, it seems like it's pretty effective. Um, well, I guess shifting gears a little, um, how do you feel about, do you have any opinions on the military conflict that's gone on so far between Russia and Ukraine? Um, in terms of how you think it's gone for Russia, why do you think, obviously, they're stalled in ways that people never imagined? Um, do you think that the outcome for the war is looking different than what was originally uh, surmised, that, you know, Ukraine is going to get crushed pretty quickly? Or what, yeah, what are your ideas here? I think a lot of people expected Russia to face opposition, but not a lot of might, mm -hmm. and to roll in pretty quickly. I think you would have found that a lot of you know, especially a few months ago, we, we when you when you start looking at a little bit more world events, you know, we had a belief, I think, that was was talked about in the open uh, sources like, hey, you know, the idea that uh, Afghanistan and Kabul is going to fall that quickly. is not going to happen. And then it did. 
Uh -huh. And it did. It kind of surprised a lot of people, probably not other people. But in the mainstream of discussion, and we didn't, we were told this wasn't going to happen so quickly. So then when this started to come about, they're like, hey, this is going to happen so quickly. Like, we don't want to get caught again saying it's not going to be quick. And I think it got a lot of us ready to see Kiev go quickly. Um, but then the Russians, <clears throat> and there's a lot of things that went on. Like, the, again, they did these exercises all the time. And in order to keep it kind of secret from these conscripts and things like that, I think, I think a few people in the Russian military were caught as off guard as the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be the prevailing opinion that very, very yeah. few people in the Russian military actually thought that a real invasion was happening. Um, and a lot of people were kind of caught off guard for a variety of reasons when it actually did happen. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, they would have, if they would have tried to get that out, they, the other piece of it that I think is interesting about thinking about is, you know, we can say Putin might be, you know, you get a lot of different ideas. Hey, he's, he's not a dumb person. He's really not. I mean, mm -hmm. he doesn't get to that level, whether he's ruthless or, uh, you know, just cutthroat or just, uh, despicable in some regards, however you want to cut it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but does he get the information that he needs? I mean, I've, I've heard some people say that like, you know, you know, back in, in old Russian times, there's two types of people around Stalin, those that told him what he wanted to hear and lived. And those who didn't tell him what he wanted to hear and mm -hmm. the other opposite, they didn't live. Yeah. So he's got an insular kind of circle of people that might want to tell, might not want to tell him, Hey, we don't, don't have the material. We don't have the, uh, the armament. We don't sure. have the gap. We don't have the logistics mm -hmm. um, to do this. Uh, but then again, he could have known it as well and been like, okay, well, if we go in and there looks to be like a stall, that's going to make the world get a little bit, you know, pressuring anyone to get involved. Does he want that? That's another question we have to ask sometimes. Because if you start bringing that in, again, it can legitimize a lot more of his automated responses. Um, you know, if, if he's going against little Ukraine and uses some kind of chemical weapons, like that's just, that's just unheard of in the, in the, in the large scheme of things. But if there's big bombs dropping from big countries, it might be more legitimate for him to use whatever he has. Cause now he said, Hey, you guys come in and, and, and done this. I went into a different country. Mm -hmm. I didn't go into NATO. Now I can dig my heels in and I have the right to use more uh, lethal means. So, uh, again, I think it's fun to kind of play both sides of, of trying to figure out exactly what he was thinking. But I don't think they had any idea that they were going to be this bad. Do you, um, how do you feel like Biden's response has been so far in terms of managing everything? In, you know, initially, I kind of, I have to admit to you, I was kind of like, let's do something. These are people that I worked with and talked with. I, I think I initially kind of, you know, I just got out of the military too. Like the guy who just hung up his uniform is sitting there kind of like, wait a minute. Like, I, I still got some more years in me. Come on, let's do this. Mm hmm um but i actually the more it goes on uh the more i see him you know working across lines with other countries i think he's doing a really good job um i think he's uh understanding that we can do a lot uh and there is probably a line where we want to stop and we're doing a lot in terms of the sanctions they are becoming more effective i think than anyone would have thought mm -hmm. um, we are being are able to get some more supplies in there you can argue that as this thing built up maybe an a good response would have been to put those things on the border, not actually put them into Ukraine, but to say, hey, listen, it's not going to take two weeks to get stuff there. It's going to take two days. Um, that's one thing that I think in hindsight being, you know, this wonderful thing we can use um, that could have messaged maybe a little bit more of our resolve to say, you know, we've got a lot of depots throughout the country. We like we could have really put some things and put some ships on alert, just sending them to the area saying we have things coming to support Ukraine, not crossing a border. Mm -hmm. But he's also working with his with his allies, and you know that's what we expect from a world leader. Do you? Um, I'm curious. What do you think are the ramifications for? I do. I do. We largely agree that like should Putin succeed, the goal is probably ousting the regime in Kiev, installing a new government, and probably leaving after recognizing um, Donetsk and Luhansk or whatever as like separate territories. If he fails. What does that future look like for Russia? Do you have any thoughts or opinions on that? Yes. Um, I think that ultimately is going to hopefully lead to a more peaceful solution than actually taking the whole place. Because I don't think he will. I don't know. Maybe it's a hope. I don't think he will. Mm -hmm. um, because then the world has a different thing to do. It's like we've lost Ukraine. Mm-hmm. 
if the world's looking at it and says we lose some Russian separatist areas that kind of weren't part of Ukraine anyway, there's been fighting going on, and now they're with Russia, and now there's less fighting in those areas, some people might see that as a win. But I think the danger is if they were to do all that and we try to take it back, then it would delegitimize what he's trying to do. And if, if that happens, then if he, I think more than anything else, he does not want to lose the face he has or the face he can keep inside his own country. Mm -hmm. He controls a lot of the information. Mm -hmm. You know, if he walks out of there with some territory, he can go back and say, look, you know, we showed them some mercy because that's who we are as Russians. We're strong, we're powerful, but we let them keep it. And to show you that we were actually winners, we walked out of there with something. Gotcha. That's I've so I've read some news stories over the past few days where it seems like suddenly the Russian messaging has kind of changed to allow them to back out, but they did it because they went in, they accomplished their mission, and now they left or whatever. Um, so yeah, maybe that is the direction forward. Um, something that's not talked about too much that I think is really interesting is um, actually two other things. Um, before I'm going to ask you the Chinese question, I'm curious what Ch China's role in all of this because. They're kind of like the boogeyman that everybody's looking for, because it feels like, and then to this question, Russia is becoming increasingly isolated from the world, which insofar as sanctioning them is probably a good thing. We want them to be punished, but um, kind of like when you've got like a nine-year-old and you've grounded them and you've taken all their toys away and you can't, like, you can't do anything else to your kid to punish them. It's like, okay, well, now we're in a really bad area because if they continue to misbehave, you've got nothing. What do, what, do, what, is, what does Russia look like in the future? Do you think that um, all of our current sanctions and everything will be lifted if they pull back? Do you think that Russia is able to survive on its own with a relationship with China? And then the next question Obama. will basically be like, what is China's role, do you think, going forward, shaping that kind of like Eurasian uh, alliance in a, in a world where Russia is cut off from the West? Yeah, Yeah, I, I will admit that my, my knowledge in that area is not nearly as good mm -hmm. but like anybody else. I, I, you know, I have my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think if, if Russia, you know, if we end up taking, getting close to taking all their toys, um, and, and, and they're going to want some back because mm -hmm. they're not, you know, your nine year old still going to, he, he has nothing to lose yeah, uh, to misbehave. He still gets the behavior he wants in the end. And he just, you know, he, he has no, he doesn't place that value, but mm -hmm. Russia needs it. And to be honest, a good question to ask is, is how destabilizing to the area would it be if Russia were not able to continue on? Mm -hmm. If, you know, this thing gets delegitimized and if there's some kind of call, call for any kind of change. I mean, you had protesters and things like that early on. That's, I wonder if he saw that coming or not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really would be surprised if anyone would have told him, oh, by the way, we're not going to have 100% support here. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that in some small regard, it's worth asking, like, do we need a stable Russia right now? Mm -hmm. Do we need them still under control of someone who has the, the, the ability and the iron fist to do what's necessary and not to have them out and freely looking for a new leader, you know, of a, of a, of a heavily nuclear armed nation? Um, while at the same time, you start to bring in China, uh, again, I, I'm reaching here on some of my ability to to speak on uh, on that, but I think the role is heh, anyone who's causing problems for someone other than China mm -hmm. is going to be good for China. Mm -hmm. So they would love for Russia the to bomb, be yeah. as meddlesome in affairs as possible without actually having any kind of collapse inside that that wouldn't be good for them mm -hmm. but um, i think they're happy to kind of kind of let them uh you know punch their weight and and, and take some uh focus off them right now mm -hmm. but i think they'll be able to use this to maneuver i don't know how but i think they're pretty smart i think they're going to be able to be able to use this to maneuver their their role in in making some decisions for for russia in the future sure gotcha um hmm well, I guess with respect to anything else, are there any other like, are there any other areas here that, um, is there information that you have by like working in the ground with people, being with Ukrainians, spending time over there, stuff that you wish that more people knew? Or do you think there's some larger narrative that the media kind of misses just because for whatever reason that you wish like more people were aware of? Um, I would go back to just uh, uh, reiterating, like I think watching the winter on fire is, is a great starting point. And if you start to understand what Ukrainians have been trying to do 
and to understand that it's always been thwarted by Russia. And, uh, you know, they probably had their opinions on how much more support they could have got from the EU in terms of joining. Mm -hmm. You saw them when this all broke down. Zelensky was like, give us the membership now. We've been asking for it. You said we're going to get it. It's going to all work out. Now is the time. So I think if you can understand just how many years Ukrainian citizens have had this impression that the West was going to welcome them as a friend at the table mm -hmm. and that seat's still empty is is something that we need to consider because when all this is over, um, how we make sure that we maintain that relationship with them because we're still going to need it mm -hmm. no matter how it ends. You know, if they get taken over completely, that's going to be a whole different thing. But even if they have lose some but have the most, you know, they're still operating their government out of Kiev, um, they're going to want that seat at the table. And what are we going to do now? What are we going to do in 2027? What are we going to do in 2030? Mm -hmm. you know, are we going to welcome them in? Because now it's going to seem as an And that's something that Russia is probably playing on, on the table is like, hey, now, even if we only get a little bit of land, it's not going to be beneficial from a, an alliance standpoint to let someone like this in because they're bringing too much baggage. Mm -hmm. but they, If they want to keep them out of NATO, if that is one of their things, doing this and taking a little bit of land, they can walk out as merciful people who just took the Russian part that they wanted. And now it makes everybody else in NATO say, do we really want to let them in right now? Sure. We really have kind of felt they were close. And now it's kind of like, hey, this is, uh, you know, someone that's bringing us too much baggage. So, you know, what's it going to be like in five years? Because Ukrainians are going to turn around and say, we've been hearing from you that we're going to join the EU. We've been hearing from you we're going to join NATO. We even gave forces to NATO. Mm -hmm. That's what you asked us to do. That's what we did. It's kind of one of those things like, I've done everything you asked me to do. So, you know, where's my ticket to the dance? Okay. Um, something more more specific to, I guess, like work that you would have done that I'm kind of interested in. What, um, what, what is it like working with like a, like a, I guess like a NATO troop um, when you've got like people from different militaries all across the world? Is it like, well, like some, I don't even know what the words would be, a regiment or I don't know how they do it in NATO, but like if you've got like a group of soldiers that you're working with, is it going to be like 98% Americans in one crew, like 2%, you know, people and whatever? Or is it like a mix of soldiers from all over the place? Are there like different drills, different training disciplines? Like what is, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, yes. So, I mean, you have your basic four areas. You know, I'm more familiar with the special operations. You have your land, air, and maritime components. Mm -hmm. um, they're not all in, not all commanded by uh, 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 multinational kind of things. But you, when you look, look at the commander of landcom, when you look at the commander of aircom, when you look at the commander of marcom, you know, you're going to find American flags flying. Uh, in the commander. We don't really have a standing special operations. It's just a headquarters for coordinating right now. Mm -hmm. um, but so it becomes that kind of face of it. Um, and I will say that they openly talk about the fact that, you know, he who writes the check, you know, calls the plays. Sure. Um, and uh, that they're very appreciative of everything, uh, but they, they often message that they want more. And so when you're out there with things, they, they, they listen to the Americans, they're very respectful, but they want a greater role. I, I, I think they really want to see some of some of these units and some of these higher level things in commanded in commanded by uh, non-U.S. people. I think they are actually willing and ready to show that uh, Europeans can take a greater chunk of their their security. I think that you know we kind of say like oh, we need to pay more or whatever. Like they think, well, we got it. If we need to do this, we can, and maybe they can. And they, you know, what's showing, especially if your adversary is your near peer uh, Russia over there, and Ukraine's giving them a little bit of a tough tough time. I mean, the rest of Europe sure could do it, couldn't they? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Anything else you want to hit on or touch on or anything else you want to chat about? No, I think the, the last thing I would say is that uh, my time with the individual Ukrainians, mm -hmm. um, they were very, they were very welcoming. They, they love to have, the, you know, meals and sit and drink and just chat. And they wanted to tell you about life growing up in Ukraine. And they were always, always super interested about, you know, I was with many different nations. Um, they weren't asking about life and growing up in France or life growing up in, in Norway. They want to know about life growing up in the United States. Mm -hmm. And they all have these dreams of visiting. They've all heard about D.C. and New York and San Francisco. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. They love San Francisco. Um, and so, you know, these, these are just like any other human being. They have their dreams. Uh, and, and they want to see them attainable at some point in their life. And they just want their own country. And they want 
to be able to make the decisions. You know, they have a moral right to their sovereignty and they just want to choose their own alliances. And, and, and I hope that they can stand strong. I think they're doing a hell of a job. I really think that they're surprising a lot of people. And uh, I think they're getting some great leadership from their president. And uh, I wish them the very, very best. And I look forward to hearing from a lot more of it when it's all said and done. All right, cool. Well, hey, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the conversation. Um, if there's anything else you ever, if anything comes up, you ever want to hop on and chat about something in particular or anything, yeah, you can always let me know. Great. Thanks cool. so much for the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Okay, bye. Right.